John 4, our reading today, is verse 27 to verse 42. Just then his disciples came back. They marveled that he was talking with a woman, but no one said, what do you seek? Or why are you talking with her? So the woman left her water jar and went away into town and said to the people, Come, see a man who told me all that I ever did. Can this be the Christ? They went out of the town and were coming to him. Meanwhile, the disciples were urging him, saying, Rabbi, eat. But he said to them, I have food to eat that you do not know about. So the disciples said to one another, Has anyone brought him something to eat? Jesus said to them, My food is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his work. Do you not say, there are yet four months, then comes the harvest? Look, I tell you, lift up your eyes and see that the fields are white for harvest. Already the one who reaps is receiving wages and gathering fruit for eternal life, so that sower and reaper may rejoice together. For here the saying holds true, one sows and another reaps. I sent you to reap that for which you did not labor. Others have labored and you have entered into their labor. Many Samaritans from that town believed in him because of the woman's testimony. He told me all that I ever, all that I ever did. So when the Samaritans came to him, they asked him to stay with them. And he stayed there two days. And many more believed because of his word. They said to the woman, It is no longer because of what you said that we believe, for we have heard for ourselves, and we know that this is indeed the Savior of the world. This is God's holy word. May he add his blessing to it, and you may be seated. And let's pray. Father in heaven, we do not pray right now as a mere tradition or a mere uh, habit, but Lord, we need you. Even as this as this, these scriptures have taught us time and time again, that, Lord, we are so prone to misunderstand, we are so prone to miss the point. Lord, we need you to cause us to be born again. We need your spirit to work in our hearts. And, Lord, we need you to give us light to our eyes that we would see the glory of the gospel. We pray that you bless us now as we look at your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, we spent the last... Uh, two weeks looking at the story of the Samaritan woman or the woman at the well. And in it, we saw the love of Christ on display in him seeking to save the lost as, as we saw his patience with her, his persistence and his sovereignty. And last week we read that the father is seeking such people to worship him. So Jesus himself tells us, I'm here seeking worshipers, people to worship God in spirit and in truth. Now, the week before, we looked at Jesus offering the gift and promise of living water, that he has come to give her this gift, and at first she doesn't know what he's, what he's referring to. Now, the connection, though, between those two sermons and these two ideas, that the Father is seeking worshipers and that Jesus has come to give living water, the connection is this. It's really summed up in the Westminster Shorter Catechism and how it begins. Question number one, what is the chief end of man? Man's chief end is to glorify God and enjoy Him forever. Now, do you see in that these two ideas? That God is seeking worshipers. He is seeking to make people change their hearts so that they worship Him. That's what God is up to in this world. That's why He sent Christ. That's His purpose. But the other purpose is that what Jesus said, if, if you only knew who I was, you would have asked and I would have given you living water. I've come to give, I've come so that you would be never thirsty again, that you would have eternal life, that you have living water bubbling up within. Now these two ends, to create worshipers and to satisfy people in God, is the same end. It's the same end as John Piper always says, literally always says, God is most glorified in us when we are most satisfied in him. God is glorified. He is worshipped by us finding our joy in him. So our joy and God's glory are, are the same. 
They're the same uh, pursuit. The pursuit of joy and the pursuit of bringing glory to God are one and the same. So the chief end of man is to glorify God, perhaps we could say through enjoying him forever. Well, that's where we left off last week. This woman of Samaria has left her water bucket behind and in her joy has gone to town to tell everyone about this man that has told her her whole life. This man who, could, could this be the Christ that we've waited for? And it's today that we see that this kind of joyful reaction, this is exactly what Jesus came to bring about. In her life, in the Samaritan's life, and in your life, and in your life, in my life, Jesus came to bring about this sort of joyful reaction. He is on mission to make worshipers of God, that is to bring people into the satisfaction and joy of knowing God himself. That is why Jesus came, to give them living water, to make them worshipers of Christ. Well, our passage today is divided into three main sections. The first section, if you look in paragraphs, you see it describes the disciples and the woman trading places, as it were. The disciples have come back from town. They went to get lunch. And they come and they see he's talking with this woman. They, they don't really ask him much about it. They just let it, kind of let it be. They say, ah, oh, it's a little weird. I don't know what to make of this. So they, but they let it be. And sh- because back then, and this is just a little note, uh, it would have been very strange for especially a Jewish man to be talking to a Samaritan woman. Um, most rabbis didn't do that. They didn't even talk to any women, let alone a Samaritan woman. So it was a little bit of an odd scene for them. But the first scene, they switch places. They come back, the woman leaves. The woman leaves. And where does she go? She goes to town. She actually leaves her bucket. She goes to town, sans bucket, to tell the whole town about who it is that she's discovered. This, And then the last third, so that's the first third, the last third is from verses 39 to 42, that describes her again and the Samaritan townspeople coming back and engaging with Jesus. Now, in the middle, interestingly, there's this meanwhile. So while she goes to get them, there's a meanwhile, a little scene between Jesus and his disciples. Jesus is talking with his disciples about food, or maybe more than food, we'll see. So let's begin by looking at the woman's reaction and who it is that she has discovered. So this is at the, at the beginning. If we go back of a couple of verses um, from last week, we see in verse 25, after Jesus has told her about, about God seeking worshipers who worship in spirit and in truth, she says this in verse 25. The woman said to him, I know that Messiah is coming, he who is called Christ. When he comes, he will tell us all things. Jesus said to her, I who speak to you am he. I who speak to you am he. So this is our first point today. Jesus is the Christ. Jesus is the Christ. He says so. And she has come, perhaps she was fishing with her her question there saying, you know, when the Messiah comes, he'll tell us all things. Maybe kind of like how you just told me my whole life. Are you the Messiah? You can kind of see it maybe veiled in her question and in her probing. And yet she goes to town and her confidence isn't fully there, but she is excited. And she says, can this be the Christ? I think he might be. This very well might be the Christ. So perhaps her faith is a little bit deficient at this point, yet this has piqued her interest and she is coming to tell them about Christ. She drops her bucket and runs to town. And what are the words out of her mouth? Come, see a man who told me, Everything, told me all that I ever I did, everything I did. Can this be the Christ? Can this be the Christ? The result is that the town comes to see. The whole town comes to see. She has piqued their curiosity. They want to test perhaps what she has said. Something's obviously up, right? She wouldn't have ran to town. Attention, everyone, everyone, hear ye, hear ye. I have some news for you. Someone's here. She wouldn't have run to town like that talking to people that probably she normally avoided. Remember, she was the woman with five husbands and a live-in boyfriend who, five former husbands and a current live-in boyfriend, who, who was at the well in the middle of the day, in the heat, not at a normal time when all the townspeople would be there, not, not in the cool of the morning or the cool of the evening. She probably avoids people. Not anymore. 
She runs into town, leaves her bucket behind to tell them who it is that she's found. They must have seen this must be something special. We got to hear what she has to say. We know this lady. I didn't really want to talk to her today. Uh, We generally don't run past, but something's up. Something is up. And so they're curious to come and see Jesus. You know, as I was thinking about this, I just thought, oh, don't you wish there was more of that holy curiosity in Kelowna? That the people that you invite to church say, tell me more. Or, yeah, I will come. I, you, people you talk to about Jesus, they say, I, I, yeah, I'm interested in that. What do you, tell me more about this. There's such, a hard, there's such a hardness that we see all around us. And this is our prayer that, oh Lord, soften their hearts. Bring people. How many are missing out on meeting Christ? Because they're, they're like the opposite of this Samaritan town. They, they hear their Christian friends and family tell them to come to Christ and they, and they just shut it off. And the only thing they can change that is the work of God in their souls. And we'll see in this passage that the work of God has been happening in the souls of these Samaritans. Now, what is meant by Messiah or Christ? Let's look at that a little bit. This is the idea of the anointed one. So she comes to say, can this be the Christ? Now, the Samaritans, they had a different word for the Christ, and, but they too were looking for him. But they only believed in the Pentateuch, so really what they were looking to see fulfilled was that greater Moses, that greater prophet who would tell us the word of God and all these things. That was more of their expectation. The more traditional, biblical expectation of the Christ um, is the son of David, the anointed king, the one who would be the savior of Israel. So for many Jews and Samaritans, both this Christ figure would have come with some political expectations as well. They would have had an expectation that the Christ would banish Roman rule and that he would restore the monarchy of some kind, that he would restore Israel to glory. And yet, as we know, the Christ turns out to be different than they thought, that they miss it in some significant ways. Now, we've already seen in these passages that what Jesus has come to bring will change everything. We've been seeing that all the way from chapter 2 through 4. Jesus will bring about an end to the temple, replacing it with himself. As he says, destroy this temple, and in three days I will rise it, I'll raise it up. Jesus has come to bring his kingdom, which is like the new wine of a wedding celebration instead of the old water of the ceremony, ceremonial uh, purification jars. So we saw that contrast as well, that Jesus has come to make all things new. New life in the spirit instead of old life, like he says with Nicodemus. Born again instead of born just once. Or as we read with the Samaritan woman, living water, not just well water. Spiritual life and satisfaction, not just physical thirst and sinful thirst. And all along, in all these stories, you might have noticed this, there have been major misunderstandings. Everyone misunderstands Jesus, including with this idea of the Christ. And we see that throughout all four Gospels, that they are expecting one thing and Jesus doesn't quite meet their expectation. They're missing the type of Christ that he is. And it's not that it's not that God changed his mind or that God is giving them something that he didn't promise. It's that they were reading it in a narrow and wooden way and missing the spiritual depths behind this. They were looking for well water when Jesus came to bring living water. They were looking for their physical life to be protected and the Romans to be vanquished when Jesus came to give them new life and to free them from the tyranny of sin and Satan. And they, don't, they haven't seen that yet. There's all these misunderstandings. Well, there's really four of them in these last few chapters, um, from two to four. And we see it again with our disciples today. As the woman goes to town, um, they, we read in verse 31 to 33, Meanwhile, the disciples were urging him, saying, Rabbi, eat. Eat something. But he said to them, I have food to eat that you do not know about. You know nothing about. So the disciples said to one another, Has anyone brought him a sandwich? Has anyone brought this guy a lunchbox? What's going on here? You notice this? It's a misunderstanding again. This is 
yet another instance. This is the fourth one. The first one we saw was when Jesus said, destroy this temple, and in three days I will, I will raise it up. The Jews say, but that took 46 years to build. What are, you, what are you talking about? They misunderstand. He's talking about the temple of his body. Or Jesus says to Nicodemus, you must be born again. What does Nicodemus say? How am I going to get into my mother's womb a second time? That, that sounds crazy. Misunderstands. And then the woman at the well, I would give you living water, but you don't have a bucket and a rope. And like, how are you going to get this water? Right? They miss it. And now the disciples, I have food to eat that you know nothing about. But who gave this guy a sandwich? Who gave this guy lunch? They don't get it. They misunderstand. And this is where the disciples are about to receive a lesson. Jesus is not only the Christ, he's on mission. This is our second point. He is, in a sense, Jesus is the missionary. Jesus is the missionary. I have food to eat that you do not know about. My food, he goes on to say, is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his work. Notice that language. Jesus is a man sent. Really, he's the God-man sent. He's the word became flesh, but he's been sent, the son has been sent from the father on a mission. He has a work to do to accomplish the work of the father. He's a missionary. Now, Jesus is probably actually hungry because he's the God-man. There's a real human nature. Um, He's hungry, just as he was thirsty and asked for a drink. But something more important is going on. And in light of his conversation, perhaps, with this Samaritan woman, and in light of what she's about to do in bringing all these Samaritans to him, something else is dominating his thoughts. He is on mission. He is reflecting on something more important than food, and he takes this opportunity to teach his disciples about it, saying There's, there are more important things than food. As we hear in the Lord's, um, in the, uh, the Sermon on the Mount, is not life more than food? In the body more than clothing? Is not life more than food? Matthew 6.25. Now this passage also has echoes of Deuteronomy 8.3. That passage that Jesus quoted during his fasting and temptation in the wilderness. Let me read that for you from Matthew 4. Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And after fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. And the tempter came and said to him, If you are the Son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. But he answered, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. That's Deuteronomy 8.3. It's the same idea, though, that we see in our passage today. I have food to eat that you don't know about. My food, what did he say? Is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his work. Here we're seeing this truth that's true for Jesus and for his disciples. This is what he's telling them to to get the message of, is that there is greater satisfaction, there's greater satisfaction in doing the will of God than there is in any food. That doing the will of God becomes more important than physical sustenance. Do you believe that? Do you know it to be true? Have you tasted and seen that the Lord is good, as it were? Have you tasted and seen that the Lord satisfies our souls more than anything on earth? You know, the picture here is to be so busy and enthralled with doing the Lord's work that meals can just skip you by. That physical sustenance fades into the background due to its relative unimportance. What glorious moments those are. I hope that you've experienced them to at least a certain degree that You're in the middle of sharing the gospel with somebody. You're talking about the Lord with someone. You're discipling someone. You're being discipled. You're in a Bible study. You're in a a worship service. And you're so focused on the things of God that you no longer realize you're hungry. You no longer think about your thirst. You forget the cold. You forget the heat. You forget anything. And why? Because in the moment, you're engaged in the most important work in the world. And it's sustaining To do the work of God is sustaining. But with Jesus, it goes beyond what perhaps we can share in this regard. Remember, he is the God-man. He is the God-man. He is divine. And there's a 
a way in which he very much differs from us. His mission and our mission are connected, but his mission is not, his mission is, let me just say, let me say what I've written here. He is strengthened to do God's work by doing God's work because he has life in himself. He is, he has come to be the food. He doesn't need food. At this moment, he is sustained by the, the spirit of God, by God himself. He has life in himself. He is, the, he is the living water. He is the bread from heaven. And that reality perhaps is on display here as well. That he's not hungry in this moment. And he can, he can bypass that because he has come on a mission to give his life for the world. Perhaps we can't imitate that as fully as he does. But he gives his life for the, for the world. He has come to save. And that leads us to ask, what specifically is the mission of Jesus Christ, the Son of God? What is this work that the Father has given him to do? And it's constantly in the Gospel of John. We just read it, verse 34. My food is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his work. If we read on chapter 5, verse 30, I seek not my own will, but the will of him who sent me. For the works that the Father has given me to accomplish, the very works that I am doing, bear witness about me that the Father has sent me. 536. And then moving on to chapter 6, he says, For I have come down from heaven, not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. Now here, listen to this. And this is the will of him who sent me, that I should lose nothing of all that he has given me, but raise it up on the last day. What's his mission? It's you. It's to save his people from their sins, that he would raise them up on the last day. For this is the will of my Father, he goes on, that everyone who looks on the Son and believes in him should have eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. And I could read more and more and more, but I'll just leave you with one more from the Gospel of John John 17, 4, 5, in the high priestly prayer, he says to the Father, I glorified you on earth, having accomplished the work that you gave me to do. And now, Father, glorify me in your own presence with the glory that I had with you before the world existed. You get the picture. Jesus has been sent on a mission. His mission is to live a perfect substitutionary life for his people, and to die an atoning death, a sacrificial death on their behalf. That is his mission. His work is to save the people that God has elected and, and chosen from before the world began. He has come on a mission to save his people from their sins. That's the work that Jesus has been marching towards. And as we get to the end of John, that's where we see him say, I have completed this work. I am at the hour for which you sent me. As it's summed up in Luke 19.10, for the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. Now this was all in the first chapter as well of John. We learned that light came into the darkness and yet he came to his own people. They didn't receive him, but to all who did receive him, he gave them the right to become children of God. Or as we read, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory. Glories of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. For from his fullness we have all received grace upon grace. This is what Jesus has come to do, to give us grace out of his fullness to save us, to bring us into a relationship with him. And, and even beyond that, to bring us to know God, to have that eternal life with him. This is the mission of the Son, and it's already underway. Jesus is the missionary. Jesus has been sent on the mission of saving a people for God. And as we read on, we see that the harvest of that mission, the fruit from that mission is already now. The harvest is now. Read with me, verse, read at 35 and on. Jesus says, Do you not say, there are yet four months, then comes the harvest? Look, I tell you, lift up your eyes and see that the fields are white for harvest. Already the one who reaps is receiving wages and gathering fruit for eternal life so that sower and reaper may rejoice together. Jesus, he just sowed the seed, as it were, with the Samaritan woman and the Samaritan town. Already she and her uh, whole town are coming to him. 
This is already happening. And the disciples, they just came from that same town, right? They just bought, brought some lunch. While, they were, while they're dealing with lunch, Jesus says, there's a spiritual feast about to take place. There's a great harvest. The harvest is now. There is work to do. We don't need to have lunch right now. We've got business. The background of this great image is from the prophet Amos. In the prophet Amos uh, chapter 9, I believe it is, it says this, Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when the plowman shall overtake the reaper, and the treader of grapes, him who sows the seed. The mountains shall drip sweet wine, and all the hills shall flow with it. Those days are here with the coming of Jesus. And did you get the picture? The guy who's planting seed is bumping up against the guy who's already baked some bread with that seed. And this guy's planting, this guy's reaping, this guy's planting a, a grapevine, and this guy's already got a glass of wine out of it. It's a, the picture is a miraculous picture of fruitfulness. That this age of the Messiah, when the Messiah comes, he's going to inaugurate a new age that is an age of spiritual fruitfulness. That there will be sowing and reaping. And those who sow are overtaken by those who reap. And there's sowing and reaping going on every which way you look. That's the picture. It's miraculous fruitfulness. And those days are here in the church age. Now you might be thinking, but these are some hard times. These are some hard ground here in Kelowna. And it maybe feels less true to us right now. That, and perhaps we are living through such a time, at least in our time, in our place, where it doesn't quite feel that fruitful. It doesn't quite feel like we're tripping over the uh, reaper and sower together. It sometimes feels slower than that and harder than that. But this is the age of the harvest. Have faith. Have faith, Christian. Look up. This is what Jesus says to his disciples then, and he says it to us now. Look up. Look up, the fields are white to harvest. Look to the multitudes of people with hope for their salvation. Jesus is still in the business of saving sinners. And we see it here, do we not? Baptisms today. A two-year-old church plant that's growing, reaching many with the gospel of Christ. Look up. See the victory, each little victory, as a portent of greater things yet to come. That's what God calls us to do. Have faith. Ever think about that? What is a Christian supposed to be known as? A person of faith. And this is, this is what we need more than anything. The church to recover faith in the power of the gospel. To say, God can do it. I'm going to pray for him to save my neighbor. I'm going to pray for him to revive Kelowna. I'm going to pray that Canada does not fall off the brink. Why am I praying that? Because I believe in God. He can do it. And he has expressed in the scriptures that he has come to save the nations. That he has come to gather a great harvest. We believe that. We ought to believe that. And if we don't, we should say, Lord, I believe. Help my unbelief. Help my unbelief. Jesus is referring uh, to a broader impact of his coming, really not just these first century Samaritans. In fact, them coming is kind of strange and out of place because here they're coming before redemption's accomplished and before the day of Pentecost. They're going to hear, I believe it's Philip, preach the gospel to them later in Acts chapter 8. But right now, they're already getting a little foretaste of it, a little mini, uh, a little mini revival, as it were, of faith before it's time. How much more true is it that the fields are white for harvest when salvation is finished, accomplished? The church has been inaugurated, has been given the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost, has been sent out with the Great Commission and with Jesus' promise, you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. You see, that's not just a command, that's a promise. We will make it to the ends of the earth with the gospel. Well, as we, as we move into the, through this passage, I want to make this third point. Uh, and just to recap, first one, Jesus, the Christ. Second one, Jesus, the missionary. And third, Jesus, the friend of outcasts. Don't miss in this passage the bigotry-destroying, barrier-smashing work that Jesus is doing here. It's an amazing turn of events. Do you remember 
what we heard earlier in the Samaritan story. Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. We don't take kindly to your folk around. We don't like each other, right? That is the relationship between Samaritans and Jews. It's hostile. No dealings. We avoid each other. And then what did we see in our passage here? As you look on to verse 39 and 40, many Samaritans from that town believed in him. And so when the Samaritans came to him, what did they say? They asked him to stay with them. Oh, Jewish rabbi, we believe you're the Christ. We don't care that we have all this hostility. That's gone. We love you. We want you. You're our Messiah. You're their Messiah. You're our Messiah. You're the, and what, is they, what do they finish with? We'll get to this. You're the savior of the world. You're the savior of the world. They've been convinced that this is the one. And through the testimony of this disreputable woman that Jesus took the time to talk to, this whole passage is filled with Jesus breaking these barriers and showing that the gospel is a gospel of grace and it's for sinners. It's for outcasts. It breaks down barriers and unites people from different different tribes, tongues, ethnicities, and it unites them into one people from the whole world. This is our Savior, a friend to outcasts, a Savior to sinners, compassionate and kind to a world lost and in need. We read this in Matthew 9 as well, a very famous verse. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion for them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Well, he remains with them two days. I just want you to consider what a gift that is, that Jesus would take the time before the time is ripe to spend two days with them. What love and grace we see from Jesus. He, he's thirsty, and yet he talks with this woman. He, he brings her to faith. He, he probably is hungry, and yet it's more important to do the will of him who sent, sent him and spend two days with these people. That's the love of Christ. And consider the love of Christ for you. He doesn't just stay with you for two days. What does Christ do for us? He stays with us forever. He comes to dwell with us as we hear in the Great Commission. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. I'll never leave you or forsake you. And yet these despised people, these Samaritans, they come to see that glorious truth. Not only is Jesus the Christ, not only is he this missionary, not only is he a friend to outcasts, no, he's the savior of the world. And this is the fourth and final point. Jesus is the savior of the world. The woman's testimony had its effect. They no longer believe because of her only, because they have heard from themselves. And we read, we have heard and we have come to know that truly, indeed, You are the Savior of the world. Now this phrase, Savior of the world, only occurs one more time in the New Testament. It's in 1 John. John uses it. And and it's a true statement of who Jesus is. But how fitting it is that it comes from the lips of Samaritans. They perhaps can see in the coming of Jesus to them that this is bigger than a Jewish Messiah situation. This is the moment in church history, in world history, where the people of God will no longer be this one chosen people of one tribe of of Abraham, but it's going to be the sons of Abraham will be sons of faith. Those who share Abraham's faith, not necessarily his lineage. That at this moment, the gospel and the presence of God is going to break free into this whole wide world. They can already see he's bridging this gap from Israel to Samaria, and he will go farther still. He is the savior of the world. We read this, we've been reading this a lot in Isaiah in our calls to worship in our services. But as we read in Isaiah, as we read in Isaiah 2, we read this, it shall come to pass in the latter days that the mountain of the house of the Lord shall be established as the highest of the mountains and shall be lifted up above the hills and all the nations shall flow to it. And many peoples shall come and say, Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, that he may teach us his ways, and that we may walk in his paths. Or in Isaiah 49, 6, 
It is too light a thing that you should be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob only and to bring back the preserved of Israel only. And what does God say to, to his servant, to the son of God? I will make you as a light for the nations that my salvation may reach to the end of the earth. And it goes on. I could, I could have listed a hundred passages that this is the dawning of the messianic age. These are pointing to the first coming of Christ, that when he comes, Samaritans and the whole world is going to come to believe the gospel. He is indeed the savior of the world. Do you believe that, Christian? Don't sell your savior short. This is what the Bible says about Jesus. We have come to worship the savior of the world. Kingdoms may rise and fall, but he is sovereign over it all. He is the Lord of history. He's the Lord of this moment. He's the Lord of tomorrow. He's the Lord of Kelowna. He's the King of Kings. And I mean, look at us. We're Christians here now, 10,000 kilometers away from where this all began. It's reaching the ends of the earth. Look at China. Look at India. Look at Africa. The gospel is advancing in this world, and it advances yet today. Now, we rightly look at the 20th century as a century filled with two world wars, nuclear war, horrors of communism and massacres. There's been a lot to lament in the last 100 years. But look a little more closely. During that same time, in spite of the communism, in spite of the war, in spite of the terror, the nations have been coming to Christ. Slowly but surely, before 1950, there were practically no Christians in China. There's a hundred million today. hundred million. India, Iran, Nigeria, Brazil. The story is remarkably encouraging if you look with faith. If you look and you don't just, you don't just see what Xi Jinping wants you to see or our media wants you to see, but you see what's really happening. The nations are coming to Christ. It might be slow. It might be hard. But they are. And they will. And they must. Why? Because he is indeed the savior of the world. He is true to his promise. You know, on the internet, some of the people talk about being red-pilled, white-pilled, black-pilled. Have you ever heard of black-pilled? Is really when someone gives you all this bad news and you start to despair. You say, oh, this world is bad, man. It's bad. I've been black-pilled, they call it. Well, don't be black-pilled, Christian. That's my message here. Do not ever give way to despair. We worship the God who is sovereign and has come to save. And as Jesus says to his disciples, look up, I tell you. Lift up your eyes and see that the fields are white unto harvest. See, believe, do not give way to despair. That's half the battle, to get Christians to believe again. If we want to win Kelowna for Christ, you need to believe that Kelowna can be won for Christ and actually engage in the work of it. We have often written these things off. We, we're just waiting for the end. We're just waiting for it all to be wrapped up. May that not be us. May we truly live the Lord's Prayer of your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Each day we pray that, saying, Lord, may your kingdom advance. Or as Paul prayed, may the word of God speed ahead and be honored. May it just zoom through this town. May we pray in faith. Save Canada, O Lord. Save Kelowna. Pour out your mercy upon us. O for Christians to have the heart of Elijah, that man who stood alone against the world, and yet he won the day because he was not alone. Do you remember the story? This is in uh, 1 Kings 18. The priests of Baal versus Elijah on Mount Carmel. 450 versus one. Two altars, two offerings. Whichever God answers by fire, that's the true God. And do you remember Elijah's prayer after the priests of Baal wear themselves out unsuccessful? What does Elijah pray? And may it be our prayer. This is 1 Kings 18, 36. O Lord, God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, let it be known this day that you are God in Israel and that I am your servant and that I have done all these things at your word. Answer me, O Lord. Answer me that this people may know that you, O Lord, are God 
and that you have turned their hearts back. Isn't that a prayer for Canada? Oh Lord, answer us. Save. Pour out your spirit upon the lost. May, they, may you turn their hearts back to you that they may know that you are God. And the Lord did answer Elijah. And the Lord has answered many in church history with that very prayer. As John Knox said, that Scottish reformer, one man with God on his side is always in the majority. It doesn't matter what we're up against. It doesn't matter how big and bad secularism looks and how godless ideologies and all the atheism and all that. We have a greater savior. Greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. And what this leads us to see is is that we're not playing religion here. We are worshiping the true God of heaven. And as we see in our passage, he's on, he came on a mission, and that mission continues today. Well, as we bring this to a close, where do we go from here? Well, here are just three quick questions. First, have you been reached by Jesus and his mission? That's priority number one. Has he reached you like the woman at the well, like the Samaritan town? And the, the, the challenge to you is simply this, believe the testimonies. Come to Jesus, hear his word and believe in him and you will have eternal life. He came to save the world, including people like you. Believe in him. The second question is this, are you now employed in his mission? Notice that Jesus doesn't just say, I'm on a mission. He tells them that they have work to do. He brings it to to a, a group effort. There are yet four months, then's the harvest. I tell you, lift up your eyes. We're, we're reaping and we're, we're sowing. We're doing this together. He, he's calling them into his work and he calls us into his work too. This is the age of harvest. This is what Paul encourages us in 1 Corinthians 3. He says, I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the growth. So neither he who plants nor he who waters is anything, but only God who gives the growth. He who plants and he who waters are one and each will receive his wages according to his labor. We are engaged in a great work. We live in the age of harvest. So are you busy working for the Lord, big or small? Maybe you're going to sow and not reap a lot. Maybe you're going to reap and not sow a lot. Whatever it happens, are you engaged in his work? And don't underestimate your testimony, your story, you telling the gospel. You say, well, I'm just little old me. I can't do much. Think about the woman at the well. Because of her testimony, a whole town comes to Jesus. This could be you. This could be you. Are you willing to be counted a fool for Christ's sake and to go and tell the world about the Savior that you've found? And the third question is this. Do you believe in the mission? And this is what I've been getting at. Namely, do you believe that Jesus will succeed? That he will indeed save the world? That the lamb who was slain will receive the reward for his sufferings. That Acts 1.8 is true, that we will be his witnesses to the ends of the earth. That the Great Commission is true, that all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to King Jesus, and therefore we can go with confidence that he has the authority and that his presence goes with us. Listen to the Lord gently rebuke us, slow-hearted disciples. Look, I tell you, Lift up your eyes and see that the fields are white for harvest. Can you see it? It will take eyes of faith. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for your word. And we just pray you'd give us faith. Help us, Lord, to believe. Help our unbelief. Cause us, Lord, to seek after you. And to make you the number one priority of our lives. That we would not, for a minute, be drifting into lesser things. Cause us, Lord, to hunger after you. May you give us this living water always. In Jesus' name, amen.